Well, we're going to begin this uh, session in uh, Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. This is kind of a, a milestone in the book of Acts because we, we have not content-wise necessarily, but we've gone through about half of the book now. We've gone through the ministry of uh, the early apostles, the 12 apostles, minus Judas, obviously, Peter being the uh, most significant individual among the 11. And now we're moving into the ministry of Paul the apostle here in chapter number 13. We were introduced to him back in chapters 8 and 9. We saw his conversion. Uh, we are familiar with him by the name of Saul. In this particular chapter, uh, we're going to see that his name is changed to uh, Paul. He's referred to or re referenced as Paul the Apostle here in chapter number 13. So we're going to look now, we're on page number 159 of our notes, we're going to look at uh, the commissioning of Paul and Barnabas. 159, Acts chapter 13. Let's look at the introduction. Much of the emphasis in the first 12 chapters of the book of Acts recorded the uh, progress of the gospel among the Jews, Jewish communities, and of course, as we've noted several times, was centered in uh, the city of Jerusalem. Wherever the gospel advances, the Spirit of God gives new life to the community. The visible sign of the Spirit's presence is the further establishment of Jewish communities where the, the message of the risen Jesus, the Messiah, to whom the apostles are witnesses, is further advanced. The promises made to Israel through Abraham, many of them still yet future, are beginning to see fulfillment in this new age. Here is the call to Israel's true exodus from the powers of the world, sin and death, but as was hinted to Abraham and the prophets, this new age would include all people. And that's where we're going in the second half of the uh, book of Acts, where we started out in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then we know that the commission in Acts chapter 1 was to go to the uttermost parts of the earth. And probably, assuredly, wherever you are, uh, at the viewing of this video, you are in or at the uttermost part of the earth. Maybe you never thought of that, but you know, uh, the gospel got to where you are, whether it's Los Angeles, New York City, uh, Kansas City, Missouri, whether or not it's Jacksonville, Florida, or Rochester, New York, all of those cities, certainly when we're talking about the United States of America, <laughs> they're the uttermost part of the earth and so we thank God for the people the many people over many generations who have been faithful in bringing the gospel and preaching the gospel to cover the uttermost part of the earth and so today there are I would say there are few places if any where the gospel is not known now there's many people that don't know the gospel but there are few places and probably none at this point in history countries, cities, where there aren't some people, at least some people, in that city, that town, that small little country, whatever it is, that haven't been at one time or another introduced to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The second half of the book of Acts will focus on the gospel's advance to the Gentile world, predominantly through the mission efforts of the Apostle Paul, and several other individuals that are mentioned that will accompany him. At the bottom of uh, the page, again, we've got uh, Acts is transitional. It's following the command of Acts chapter uh, 1 8. We see the transition from chapters 12 to chapter 13. And then we see an outline of chapters 13 through 28. Now, there's five major events that happen in this second half of the book. The first is Paul's missionary journey, his first missionary journey, and that takes place in chapters 13 and 14. Then in chapter 15, we see the famous Jerusalem Council, where the apostles had to get together and make sure that they 
all were on the same theological page. Uh, remember, this is a great transition from Old Testament law and uh, people who have lived generations and for centuries under the domination or control of an Old Testament law. For these people now to move from the law and recognize that the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth has come by Jesus Christ. To make that transition was not an easy transition. Lo um, blood was spilt. Uh, money was spent. People's lives were invested to make that transition from Old Testament mentality, Sabbatarian Jewishness to New Testament Christianity and the church as we understand it. So the Jerusalem Council is a, one of the high points of the second half of the book. Paul was involved in three missionary journeys. The second then begins uh, toward the end of chapter number uh, 15 and goes all the way through chapter number 18, verse 22. His third journey goes from 1823 to 2116, and then as we know, Paul was summoned, he was arrested, and uh, he was accused, and he made an appeal. He said, hey, I am a Roman citizen, and I appeal to Caesar. If you're going to charge me, indict me with crimes of any kind, I have the right to appeal to Caesar. So the last part of the book, the remaining chapters of the book, uh, speak of Paul's journey to, uh, to Rome and ultimately his uh, house arrest and incarceration there. So we're looking at the first missionary journey here is outlined on page 160, just underneath that. We can see Paul and Barnabas are sent from Antioch then these are the places that they go. They're listed. Cyprus, Antioch of Pisidia, Iconium, Lystra, and then a return trip is made. And in chapter 14, they bring a report to Antioch. Now, it is, it's customary for missionaries today to report to their sending church. They ought to do that. When people in churches are putting their money into the plate, uh, their prayers up before God, sacrificing their resources to help the gospel to go around the world. Missionaries are people who are sent, like Paul and like Barnabas, owe it to their sending church to come back, and I don't mean in a Wednesday night service, but over a period of time to bring a report to their people. Get to know the people in the church again. Uh, get to involved in the activities of the church. Get reacquainted. That's what I have recommended for years. We have sent, in, in, uh, from First Bible in Rochester, we sent many missionaries to the field. And uh, it was my recommendation that missionaries would return for a season, not just for a Sunday morning or a, week, a weekend or for a Wednesday night service, but they would return and spend some time in the church with the congregation of the people to get reacquainted so people would know who they are. That was good for everybody. It was good for the missionary to get a little bit of a break. It was good for the people to get reacquainted. And ultimately, people support people with their prayers, with their monies, with their resources. They support people that they know that they have built personal relationships with. So we certainly see evidence of that here at the end of Paul's first missionary trip. So let's pick up the reading in the middle of 160, Acts 13, verse number 1. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So as we begin following the missionaries, Saul, Paul, and Barnabas, 
on their first missionary journey, we can note several things about the church at Antioch. Now, there's five things at the bottom of this page that are listed that are noteworthy. This, this is a good church, no question about it. They have, these are, by the way, these are priorities, spiritual leadership, God-centered ministry. This isn't, you know, and I don't mean to, to uh, uh, be negative, but this isn't about reaching people for Christ, the gospel ministry. You know what it's all about, primarily? Bringing glory to God. And we bring glory to God by reaching people for Christ. The Father seeks such to worship Him. That's John chapter 4, verse 23. So when we talk about evangelism, um, being fishers of men, when we speak of being ministers of reconciliation, when we talk about being soul winners, this is what we are talking about, bringing glory ultimately to God. That's the purpose for our ministry and in everything we do to bring glory to Him. Spiritual leadership, God-centered ministry, they were locked on the mission. Their, the desire to please God brought them to a place where the mission was, was the secondary. It's of secondary importance to pleasing God, but it was a direct result of that. They were being obedient to Him. They effectively dealt with opposition. The gospel has always had opposition and always will, and they witnessed as a result of their faithfulness, obedience, and prayer, they witnessed supernatural results in their victories. So, we see uh, uh, some folks listed here, and what we're, what we're doing is we're seeing what, exactly what did they do. Before they sent Paul and Barnabas, stop and think about these things, they fasted. They fasted. I believe it's Isaiah chapter 58, probably of all chapters in the Bible that speak more to the subject of fasting than anything else. I know this. When I fast for the right reasons, God gets my attention a whole lot more than at other times. My stomach reminds me frequently, how come you're not eating? Oh yes, now I remember why I'm not eating, because every time my stomach provokes me, I'm going to enter into prayer for that which I desire of Him. They fasted, and the Holy Ghost said how that exactly took place. I don't believe that was an audible voice. I believe that was the spiritual sensitivity of the leadership of that church. They realized, and of course Paul and Barnabas realized, that they were to be the sent ones, the apostles, the missionaries. So the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul. That's a tough thing, to send your best to the mission field, not your young 21 year old man who's just got this wonderful dream and he's got a romantic vision of going off to some um, uh, south sea island where people speak a totally different language and he's going to bring the gospel and he is going to bring everyone to conversion there while he's living in this paradise or jungle or whatever it is that he has in mind separate me mission and missionaries are separated from their family, they're separated from their church, they're separated from their friends. And you think about that. Some of us, in fact, most of us, really don't do we very well when we're put in those kinds of circumstances. They desperately need our support, our prayer support, our friendship. They need our financial support because they realize that we truly value them when we do support them financially. Many missionaries go to places where they cannot get financial support in the culture where they minister. Either there is no money there, uh, the people are uh, frankly are third world people who have little income themselves, or the government uh, in that country forbids uh, foreigners to work and earn a living in that culture and take money away from other people in that culture. They need to be supported by home church people. I don't need to say any more about that in the United States of America. 
we're all doing pretty well financially. The poorest of us is wealthy compared to two-thirds to three-quarters of the rest of the world, maybe more than that. Most of us live in the top 5% of the world's um, economic strata. In other words, 95% of the people in the world probably live below economically where you're living today. Let's pick it up over here in uh, uh, page 161, Acts 13, verse number 4. So let's watch the progress. So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, that's important. People are sent by the Holy Ghost. This isn't somebody walking up to the preacher on Sunday morning saying, you know, I've had this happen to me, by the way. Pastor, God has called me to go to such and such a place. How much are you going to support me? Whoa! Time out! Just a second. There's a few things. I'm glad that God has called you to go someplace to minister, but the how much are we going to support you, there's a few things in between those two statements that have to happen. A few things. You need to qualify yourself. You have to become faithful in this church before I'm going to send you or encourage our people to send you anywhere. You're going to have to be a giver. You're going to have to be a leader. You're going to have to be a recognized as a spiritual individual right here before we're going to send you anywhere. Please. Sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues. There's Paul. He can't stop preaching to Jews. He's got to go to the synagogues of the Jews. And they all had also John to their minister. John Mark is accompanying them. When they had gone through the isle of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bargesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. Well, it, uh, I don't have to tell you that Bar-Jesus wasn't happy about this at all. But Sergius Paulus, is, he's interested. He's a seeker. Now, he's associated with bar -Jesus. He's a spiritual individual. He's looking for spiritual truth. Everybody's looking for truth, hope, and love. Sergius Paulus is looking for truth. Every person that walks into your church is looking for three things. They're looking for the truth, they're looking for you to give them hope, and they're looking for love, and hopefully an opportunity to love someone else. Well, anyway, picking it up in verse 8. But Elimus, He's the sorcerer, that's his name, for so his name is by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, here is the place where the name switch takes place, verse number 9, in parentheses, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil. I guess there's a time to call people out, isn't there? That's what Paul did here. Thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist, a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, that is Sergius Paulus, then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Again, here's a sign. A sign takes place that validates the ministry of the apostle. He has given, he is given by the Lord, he's given the authority and the power to blind this individual. Now, Paul knew what this was all about. Remember back at his conversion? Remember what happened to him? He was blinded himself, if I'm not mistaken, for three days. Go back to Acts chapter 9, where his conversion is recorded. 
It's also recorded in Acts chapter 22. It's also recorded in Acts chapter 26. Go back and see what happened to Paul himself. He was blinded. And so Elimus, the sorcerer, is blinded. And Sergius Paulus, the seeker of truth, is watching all this and he said, you know, there's something to this. When he saw what was done, believed, verse 12, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. And when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perge in Pamphylia, and John, this is John Mark again, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. Well, that's just kind of a P.S. at the end of verse number 13 there that John departed. But this became an issue of contention between Paul and Barnabas a little bit later on, as we will see. John left. Why John left? I really don't know. I do know this. In studying the New Testament, I know that John, Mark, and Paul, they were uh, reconciled later on. But at this particular point, Paul is not happy with John, Mark. Whatever his reasons were for leaving this group of individuals, or these two other individuals, Paul was not happy with his explanation or his excuse, and this called, caused a great deal of co uh, contention between Paul and Barnabas. Of course, John Mark was related to Barnabas. We'll see that a little bit later on. Well, the first missionary trip, page 162, it's going to, chapters 13 and 14, this is going to encompass about 900 miles. Cyprus, where they go, was uh, Barnabas's home, according to Acts chapter 4. They went to the synagogue, this was their custom, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And here we see that John Mark, in verse uh, 5, he was Barnabas's cousin, according to Colossians chapter number 4. We see some other thoughts. Sergius Paulus, he was a deputy, that is, he was the governor. He, ha he held, if I'm not mistaken, a similar position to Pontius Pilate. And what Pilate held the one who dealt with Christ and Christ's crucifixion. Sergius Paulus was a deputy. Elimus, the Greek name for Bar-Jesus, he was a sorcerer. And of course, the text illustrates for us the whole idea of spiritual warfare. Ephesians, chapter number 6, verses 10 to the end of the chapter. How we are to fight the spiritual warfare. There are many passages of Scripture in the Bible where we see that there is opposition, spiritual opposition. Probably the greatest illustration example of that would be coming to the book of Revelation and seeing the uh, Antichrist and the false prophet and all of these individuals and, of course, all of the visions and uh, things that take place there in the book of Revelation. Um, many of which are symbolic, but, the, but all symbols represent something that is true and real. Remember that about symbolism. Some people say, oh, the book of Revelation is just a bu bunch of symbols. Uh, you can't really read that and understand that. Listen, my friend, those symbols are symbolic of something real. That's what symbols are. They're not symbols of, some, symbols of something that, that are unreal, there are symbols of things that are real. Spiritual warfare. You might even ask yourself the question, how is all this spiritual warfare, how is that manifested in our culture today? I don't know that we spend a line, not a lot of time talking about that. Maybe we don't see it. Maybe we're not sensitive to it. But it's real. It's real. We read it all through the Gospels. We read it through the book of Acts. There is no reason for us to believe that spiritual warfare, particularly with the statements of New Testament epistles written by Paul, there's no reason for us to believe that spiritual warfare is unwarranted at this particular time. Uh, we noted in verse 9 that uh, Saul's name is changed there. We've given you maybe a reason why, some speculation on that. Uh, Paul directly confronts the individual. He blinds him in verse number 11. The deputy believes 
It was a result of the signs, and then Paul and his company, um, uh, they're loosed from Paphos, it says in verse 13. The group leaves Cyprus and sails to the mainland of Asia Minor, Turkey, and to the city of Perge, pronounced Perge. And this is where John departs there. So what are some of the applications? Some of the applications of this text here. It is of utmost importance to have strong home in sending churches. I cannot emphasize that enough. Um, people that would listen to a video presentation like this are generally going to be missionary-minded churches. So I'm not speaking in a vacuum right now, and I'm not speaking to people who are sitting there saying, what is he talking about? I don't get it. I'm talking to people that would view a video like this. Your missionaries deserve your support. We get excited about people when they announce that they have been called and then the church, the leadership, in whatever way that they have chosen to do this, they begin to train this individual to go. Maybe we take a, you know, a, a trip to that country or that city and we uh, check it out and scope it out and try to come up with a game plan, a strategy, how to reach that. But we've got an individual or individuals, a couple who have volunteered to be the people who will go. The church prays about that. The church then, if, they, if the church leadership believes that this person is the right person or people to do this, then they, what we read in Acts chapter 13, takes place. This is a, an important spiritual decision because we're talking about the lives of human beings who are our brothers and sisters in Christ. We just don't send anybody out there to be eaten by the wolves. You understand that? We need to send people who are prepared, people we know who are spiritually adept, knowledgeable in the scriptures, who have proven themselves to be leaders in our church already. We, they have proven themselves to be concerned about souls, to be good teachers, to be the type of people who will follow through, who are not soft, who won't make excuses about the difficulties they face, it's of the utmost importance that we support people like that, encourage them. The movement, calling and sensitivity of the Holy Spirit is vital in local churches to discern and obey God's will and call. This should not be done quickly. This should be done with prayer, with forethought, with conversation, examination, and it should be agreed upon by the leadership, the pastor, pastors, elders, deacons of the church, that this particular individual or individuals are the type of individual that we can send, and we are going to commit ourselves to support this person. We're not going to send them out there on a string and then cut the string once they've gone 300 miles away. Once they're on the airplane and headed for the other continent, clip, that's it, we're done with them. We got them on their way. They'll have to figure it out from here. No, not so. The nature of the mission requires the obedience of mature and seasoned Christians, and missionaries will encounter intense opposition. Boy, there's a lot of lessons here. If you turn the page, uh, the prominence of the Holy Ghost is mentioned. Disciples are witnesses. We've seen that many, many times. Preaching begins in Jewish synagogues. Is that enough references for you to prove that? Do not be afraid to witness to religious people. That's what Paul did. He witnessed. He went right after the religious people. Don't be afraid. But you need to know what you believe and why you believe it before you start witnessing to people, different people. You, ha you have to be biblically prepared to answer their objections or deal with their heresies. You need to know what the Bible says about the various subjects and certainly about salvation. No question about it. Spiritual warfare is brought up there. Mission work is work, unquestionably. By the way, is missions or is the mission the heart of your church? Missions 
is not a church program. The church is God's mission program. Think about that. The, your church is a mission statement, and again, your church is in the uttermost parts of the earth. It was a object, an object of missions at one point. Now it's established. Now keep the ball moving to the next city, to the next town with qualified leaders. Be filled with the Spirit is to be engaged and involved in the furtherance of the gospel and the success of the mission. And again, this is a reminder. The last thing on 164 is a reminder what you've already seen earlier in this lesson. This is what great commission churches are made of. Spiritual leadership, a God-centered ministry. They're focused on doing the great commission. They meet and overcome opposition through prayer and for the glory of God. And they will, and we do, witness supernatural results. All right, we're going to take a break here in just a minute. Um, think about what we've talked about. We're going to continue and finish the rest of uh, chapter 13 in our next session. And uh, uh, we're going to talk about, the title of that is, What Must I Do to Believe? You know, the question is, what must I do to be saved? That's a great question in chapter 16 of the book of Acts. But we need to be careful about leading people to Christ and not misleading them. I heard someone of authority recently say this. Well, this is where I was before I got saved. And when I realized that all that I had to do was ask Jesus into my heart, that made it simple and I got saved. Now, I've been around a while. I understand what the person is saying, what they mean by that. But there's much more to believing than just saying, I'm going to ask Jesus into my heart. There are certain things that you need to understand and believe before you do that. We'll be back, we'll be back with some answers to the question, what must I do to believe?